everybody has managed to turn off on stage magically. And I'm plugged in almost. So at that case, we'll now declare this officially open. And uh, we're terrifically on time. So first question. Uh, one, one down here at the front, Kerry. We've seen a lot of great Australian innovations head overseas where the investments and the markets are greater. Um, what do we need to be doing to keep those innovations here in Australia? And are there any structural barriers that we need to be addressing? And to answer your question about how we need to enlarge this pool of talent, which you said people get by going and working in a company which is overseas, which is a multinational, and which is competitive and which is doing well, does that mean that for Australian managers to be able to compete in that market, they have to leave Australia with their families for six months or a year? Anyway, over to you. You, you start off your own. I will completely ignore what you said. And Good. I will Excellent. Good start. immediately return back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, I think, uh, why would somebody move from here to somewhere else? It, it basically boils down to, to two things. It, it, and it depends a little bit on what industry and structure you're in. The first one is about two-thirds of all manufacturing needs to be located very, very close to where the dominant market of what it produces is. Okay? So if the largest market for your product sits in the U.S., you will go to the U.S. If the largest market for your product sits in China, you will go to China type thing. So, so that's true about two-thirds of, of manufacturing. The, the other third of manufacturing is more around the closeness to the key capabilities of what is needed to do what, you need, what you're doing, right? Be that uh, research, development, and so on. So it's easy to explain then why a, a, an innovation in the first situation would move from a smaller market to a larger market. It's, it's quite natural. Uh, the second one is, is more interesting because that boils down to a concept of, of economic complexity. So if you, have a, if you have an economy where everything is present, you know, you have a little bit of everything, then if I have a random event, an entrepreneur that comes up with a widget, uh, then I can always find somebody to help me bend the plastic or somebody to do the metal and somebody to do the accounting and all this kind of stuff. It's easy. So I can start up my activity and if I am then depending on that core knowledge base, I will stay where I am. Now there is a, there is a measurement around these, these economic complexities and it goes, it's developed in Harvard and it goes from around let's say two and a half on a scale to minus one. So if you sit on two and a half, you have everything known to mankind operating in your economy. If you have minus one, you have one guy with a wooden stick walking across the desert. That's, that's around it. So if you look at these things, the most complex economies, they sit at around two. That's Japan, that's Germany. It's basically those type of economies. The least complex economy sits very low down, and you can guess what they are. US is about 1.6, Australia is z minus 0 0.3. Now, and what that means is that if I come up with a random economic activity in Australia, it's highly unlikely that I'm gonna go and be able to build it here, even if I want to, because the things are just not present. So what you need in order to retain them is to ensure that you increase the economic complexity. And that means you need to have industrial structures there that are highly complex. And the moment, the most complex industrial structure that we have in Australia is automotive. So by removing that one, we're going to drop from about minus 0 0.3 to round about minus 0 0.4. That means it's going to be even less likely that an economic activity that is randomly produced by somebody will be able to stay in this country after that, solely as a consequence of not finding all those things that it will need to operate. That was reasonably long, but trying to put it in context. Mm. Sweet. Yep. Just to add a uh, slightly different aspect to what uh, Joran has already, you know, uh, very eloquently, you know, uh, uh, spelled out. So there's always the notion that you know we might offshore the making of things uh, while we retain, you know, the innovation, you know, activities. And Joran's really painted a picture that you know that you know with the co without the complexity in, in the ecosystem, you might not be able to do that. But more and more you're finding that even the innovation activities also get offshore to the markets you know, where the manufacturing occurs. And a lot of it's just simply because you've got to get closer to the customers. Uh, and there was, uh, there was a bit of work that uh, came out a couple of years ago that provided a slightly different dimension to that is that if you were to set up production, let's say in Thailand, for instance, 
You can't ask your local managers to do dumb work. You actually have to give them you know, stimulating, challenging roles. And that's actually part of the reason why you shift your innovation there in the first place in order to retain your local workforce. So, this whole, so there are a lot of forces uh, you know, kind of uh, acting against the, even the ability to retain uh, innovation in, uh, in this country when you offshore the manufacturing. But on the other hand, we're seeing examples where uh, you know, uh, European or US companies are locating the R&D here right, because you actually get access to excellent capability, you know, fairly you know, good political environment, you know, all, all the rest of it. So, so, so there is also potential for inflow you know, of uh, uh, investment uh, into this country as well. So it's not all just uh, one way, but, uh, but this whole idea that you can uh, just, you know, hang on to the high-end stuff and just offshore the low-end stuff. Uh, it needs to be challenged a little bit because, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else want to comment? No? Uh, Joran, if I were to want to look this up in Wikipedia, do I look up economic complexity, which is the measure of that scale from e minus one to... Economic complexity index is what you look under. In I index. Right. Okay, another question from the audience there. I haven't heard of that term. Uh, y y where? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. There, hang on. Uh, you, yeah, okay, microphone coming through. <laughs> okay, there we are. I wasn't sure if you were pointing to another person. Economic complexity index, never heard of that. Yes. Right, okay, um, yes. My question's to John. Um, the part about your presentation, John, that really I found interesting was the uh, two digit analysis and the amount of people who we could say have manufacturing skills and aren't working in manufacturing. Um, and the implication uh, of that for the economy, and in a way it's the same as what Gorn was saying, if you, um, economic complexity would uh, go down because we've lost a key part of manufacturing. So I, I guess this, uh, this idea that in manufacturing we're training for more than manufacturing uh, is really important. And that slide, and I haven't... Done, didn't show the movement of that over time. And I'm just wondering whether you could comment on, if you like, uh, the progression of that slide, whether the, how it's changed over the past and where you think it might go in the future. You know, what, how much in manufacturing have we been training for other areas and is that going down or up and what's the movement been like? That's, um, that's, that's a good question. That's the, 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 the core of my argument, so I'm, I'm glad... Um, that message has got out. That's actually quite hard data to get. So I, I put up the historical information about the fitter and machinist, and I was actually drawing on census material we'd pulled out in 1991. My suspicion is its contribution has gone up as the sector has declined. So um, this is all part of a broader analysis I have that um, transferable skills are a public good. And transferable skills aren't just given out by TAFEs or private RTOs or universities. As we've mentioned a number of times today, uh, the way in which people learn to apply abstract reasoning in practice is probably the most important skill of all. And you can only learn that in workplaces. And historically, manufacturing's actually been pretty good at doing that. It's been a, hard, a high part of the apprenticeship system. So I can definitely say with the fitters and machinists, which is a you know iconic classification, that's definitely the case, but my intuition is that I think that's representative of other occupations, but I haven't done it. I'd have to pull the information out. It's actually quite complex to do, but not, not impossible, and you know, not a huge amount, but I just haven't done it, so I'm giving you an intuitive response, but it feeds into a, something that we, I don't think we have talked enough about, which is um, having a new vision for work integrated learning. That's kind of implicit in the ORPA report, and it's been implicit in a lot of our discussions, but I think if manufacturing is going through a, a transformation, it needs to say we are a very important platform for high level capability in each of those domains I talked about. You can develop engineering outside of manufacturing, you can develop accounting skills outside of manufacturing, but the complexity that you have in, a, in an advanced manufacturing environment is usually of an order that you don't find in many other parts of the economy and that, that's what you're losing. So you'll keep engineering capability, you'll keep logistics capability, but it won't be of the higher order. And I think if manufacturing's positioning itself for the next five to 10 years, I say uh, we want to provide a platform for renewal across the economy. And that's the one thing that we are adding. It's not just that we're another industry like the mining industry and like farming, 
we are actually giving a higher order development there. Okay, anybody else? No, another question uh, here in the uh, back row there, thank you. Um, a question for John about the um, Australian training system. Um, given what you've said about the need for the adaptability of the workforce and indeed the, the issues of managerial competence have been raised by a number of, number of speakers, um, how do you see the capacity and capability of the training system to be able to deliver the skills to, uh, that are needed in the workforce? Look, it's, it's mixed. I don't think you can you know, condemn or celebrate. Um, I think as parts of Australia's apprenticeship system are amongst the best in the world. And you know, I sat on the um, expert panel looking at the apprenticeship system in the 21st century. And you know, we produce people who are in demand worldwide at that level. Uh, in other parts of the system, we've done a lot of research on this and we've shown that basically the system trains for yesterday. You know, the, the, but I, I don't want to dwell on that for too long. I want to look at where the system actually works well, and I think that's what we've got to build upon. I think, and anyone who knows me knows I'm not a flunky for management, I think management's taken a pretty heavy hit today. Uh, and and uh, can I just say, I think management is incredibly difficult, and I think uh, manufacturing managers have had a really hard time, particularly with the, the dollar the way it's been. And I think instead of continuing to beat up on the managers, I think we need to think about what, what it would take to build up that capability. And, you know, I don't want to sound a bit old fashioned, but my dad was in the armed forces. And I mean, the armed forces for about two or 300 years have recognised that you just can't pluck someone up off the street and put them in an army and they'll learn how to lead. Um, I come from a management school. Management schools can give the basics, but I do think we need to think about like having, you know, a manufacturing managers institute, you know, and, and that's got to be linked in closely with support structures around work integrated <coughs> learning. So we don't have that kind of thing at the moment. Managers are not performing as well as they, they could. I don't think that's a personal failing. I think it's a structural failing. And I think we can learn from things like the apprenticeship system in offering ways forward. I haven't, I don't think we've seen much of that to date, and I think that's a challenge when thinking about moving forward, what you can do. And, and as I said to the re response to Richard's question, I think manufacturing is a great training ground for that, given the complexity of the, the things you've got to manage. It's a great training for management in the broad. John, I, I agree completely, and if I may just add a little piece of information there. The, um, if you go around and look in the manufacturing industry broadly and, and identify these high-performing companies that I identified before, they, they do exist out there and they do fantastically, it is highly common, it's very, very common in other words, that management in those firms have a background in automotive. And, the back, they, and that doesn't matter what sector that the industry op that, that firm operates in. And that is because that is the one global supply chain we've had where managers have been forced to learn to operate on a very high skill level because that industry sector is operating in the most competitive environment possibly. So if you look around and talk to manufacturers, frequently they've hired these type of people and they, they on average, uh, to give you a number to put this in, in dollar context, on average when you, when you don't have those skills in the firm, you move somebody from that skill level into the firm they move five percentage points from the turnover to the bottom line. That's a huge amount of money mm -hmm. that they bring through their managerial skills that they have learned somewhere else. And that's a practical illustration of that learning by having to learn to do rather than learning by having to learn to talk about it, you know, which is a big distinction. And see, this is where you know I have controversially said in the past, I think we've got to see on-the-job training as a public good. You know, in human capital theory says there's foundation training over here, which is generally and universal, and the person should pay for it or the state should pay for it. And there's firm-specific training over here, which the firm should pay for. Well, there's a big thing in the middle called transferable skill learn on the job. And our public policies are very poor at recognising and developing that. The closest we get to it is the apprenticeship system. Um, but it is only for one category of labour and it's got problems of its own. But once again, you know, I'm trying, I'm often regarded as a poly, poly, sorry, poly, Pollyanna in these settings. Manufacturing is going through a hard time. I think it's got to set itself up as a platform for playing this role. You know, it's not just a matter of, you know, um, 
forgetting everything and trying to get as much product out the door to save the, the sector, that's just not going to work. The sector's got to set itself up as integral to the renewal of the economy at large, and it provides a great platform, but it's going to have to be helped in doing that in the same way the apprenticeship system's been helped, you know, in the same way the Army's helped in building up that capability. It's a public good and it gets public support, but it's not just manufacturing is a good in its own right, it's manufacturing has great spillover effects, and I think that's the way to develop that. Another question right at the back there? Uh, yeah, I'll put this to the whole panel. Um, I think, Goran, you mentioned that on that Harvard scale, we're going to go from 0.3 or minus 0.3 to minus 0.4 because of auto. Um, the auto industry is taking a hell of a hit. What are some of the things that can, or what could be done from a public policy point of view from a whole lot of stakeholders in the sense of trying to mitigate how far the 0.3 is going down to 0.4 or 0.5? Shall I start and if I was apostrophed in the question? Um, the, um, I would say what you need is to uh, accelerate the growth of firms that have high complexity in what they do, both products, uh, processes and, and um, activity <coughs> systems. Um, and, and if you look at those, you know, generally speaking, you find things like you know, machine tool, machine tool activities. I mean, Sui mentioned before that we seem to be slow in taking up the 3D printing cluster capability issues. That's one of those that have high complexity in what it does. Uh, it's about increasing the value adding to the raw materials that we ship out. You know, we need to have higher value adding in food products. Doesn't matter whether it is functional food through science or luxury by consumer understanding. Likewise with some of the minerals and other type of raw materials. So the complexity that you get by being forced to add value to that is, is an area we need to go. And, and um, that will be simplified if we had many other OECD countries left behind what is a somewhat um, outdated notions in two domains. One is the GDP actually measures what happens. Um, you know, if we all sued each other tomorrow and we all went to court for a very long time, GDP would go up. You know, gross value added would not go up. So there is something about looking at what the value adding change is in this scenario. So what Australia has is a decline in GVA and an increase in GDP, which is why tax revenues have collapsed, right? But it, you know, it's about the number issues. And many OECD countries are looking at other type of numbers to capture that value adding. Mm -hmm. So that's one area we need to do. The other one is to understand that statistic is historical. And with any apology to our historians in this, uh, in this panel, it, it, that actually creates some misunderstandings. Let me give you a practical example. I can present you with a company. It has 25% of its employees working in R&D. It has 50% of its employees working in services has 25% in manufacturing and management. Is that a service company or manufacturing company? Well, statistically, it's a service company. Now, it, 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 uh, the problem is that the services would not have existed if they didn't manufacture the product. The name of these companies happen to be Ericsson. Right? So it's a classical example of, of how manufacturing companies look. And that is part of this perceived decline that suddenly this company is a, is a service company. No, no, it isn't. It's still manufacturing. It just does services as well. And if manufacturing died, so would the services. So we have erroneous statistics and erroneous understanding of these things. So I do think we need to go up that route of value adding. If we do not do that, our complexity will continue to decline as things move overseas, as we indicated, also R&D and other type of administrative tasks. Mm. Yeah, perhaps just to add to that, I mean, the, the value adding path, I mean, that that's mandatory, right? Whether or not you can increase scale or not, that's another issue. I mean, uh, if you can actually value add in high value, uh, low volume, and make money out of it, that's fine. I guess with the automotive uh, supply chain, we always talk about diversification. I mean, you know, so recently that's been in the news. Easier said than done, I mean, because uh, diversification requires not only skill, but capital uh, to retool and all that. But more important, it needs market knowledge. So you find a lot of firms who are technically very competent, who perhaps have, may have the workforce that can diversify, but they actually don't know where to diversify to. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a common observation uh, amongst a lot of, uh, you know, these component manufacturers that the breadth of their market knowledge is not so good and their actual market development or business development capacity is actually not there in, because they never had to, had to do it. So, so I, I guess it's just making a point that you know, it's easy to, to say that firms should do certain things, but whether they actually have the ability to 
by themselves or whether they know who to partner with, you know, in order to, to diversify something else. Um, from my perspective, um, heighten the level of awareness. A lot of the companies I do work with still don't believe there's a problem um, or they're too slow to actually react to it. So, so challenging them to a point to actually see an alternative future has been a strategy I've been using with a lot of firms to really get them to see the what if. But it's then just not showing them what if, it's actually showing them how to. Um, and, and, and giving them a, a model of actually, well, what would you need to do in, in, a, in, a, in a disruptive environment, say? Um, to give you an example, but of large manufacturers, I work with some German manufacturers, and one, a German automotive manufacturer, and they're going to electric vehicles. They ran this project not as an R&D project, but as a capability building program, where they actually took a team of five people and grew it to 350 people to reconceptualize what a particular sort of electric vehicle might be. They did that to grow the capabilities to challenge their thinking beyond just a manufactured vehicle, to bring in new capabilities, to design the actual value chain around it. So it wasn't framed as this is an R&D project, but this is now capability. Those 350 workers then go back to their own divisions to actually then talk about what this new future might look like. So it's another way of actually looking at capabilities development. Um, I've got a different take again, because I do think the passing of um, the auto sector is hugely significant. And I think there are two opportunities to work with. The first is that I think manufacturing in Australia will fall back to its historic roots, which it was as a service sector to agriculture, mining and the instrumentalities. So I think we've got to recognise that, you know, manufacturing did exist before protection and particularly advanced engineering capability was very strong around ag mining and instrumentalities. The second opportunity, and so that means there's an, you've got to think differently. It's not manufacturing as we've thought about it, it's actually as a support area and there's huge demand there. And if you get that right, huge opportunities. The second thing is how do you handle the uh, vacating of the field by auto? And here I'm quite inspired by the way the Swedes handled the shutdown of their shipbuilding industry in the late 70s and early 80s. They didn't say this is the end of the shipbuilding industry. They, they said this is an opportunity to take those skills into new domains. And they used the old shipbuilding yards as incubators for skill. And I think we've got to think about that. It's not how do we have an orderly closure of auto. It's how do we use this as a site for renewal? So the question then becomes, well, what if they're the opportunities, you know, service to other areas and um, using auto as a site of regeneration, I'll be unashamed here. I think we've got to have STEM as the key issue. And I, I think people have talked about STEM loosely, but I think, and, and it's not good enough. Look, Australia's been talking about STEM since I was a public servant. I joined the public service in 1985. I mean, we've talked about the crisis in STEM since I was, you know, kind of fresh out of university 30 years ago. Clearly, people have been talking about it, nothing's been happening. So I'll be bold. Let's learn from what Australia's done better than anywhere else in the world, handling the AIDS crisis, right? Australia changed sexual behaviour better than any other country first. Now, if you can change people's sexual behaviours, you can change your attitude to maths, right? So, <laughs> so it seems to me that the key issue here is the key issue here is leadership, and there was very there was very clear political leadership, bipartisan leadership from both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, but very clear leadership from the Health Minister at the time, massive mobilisation of civil society, and empowerment of civil society. And for me, I think the leadership for this must come from the engineering employers supported by um, the highest levels of government. It's not going to happen otherwise. It can't be another idea we tack on the, the back of the agenda. We've got to look back in 10 years' time and say we've decided to have a quantum shift in the way in which we as a society think about STEM. Unless something like that happens, unless you have an intervention on the scale of the AIDS campaign, we're going to be sitting here in 10 years' time having the same conversation. So that's a, there are opportunities, it's not all gloom and doom. The success, however, will require having a clear vision around STEM as part of it and very clear leadership from the engineering employers and our, our political leaders. Another question from the audience. Um, Rudder's coming around in a loop to you, so keep your hand up and I'll come into the row behind you and then I'll pass the microphone across. Luckily, there's too short time for me to give yet another anecdote. So you're lucky there. 
Um, with the negotiation of the free trade agreements and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, given what we've seen on the figures today, do you think they will impact or accelerate the current trends? And it might be 10 years we're having this conversation, mm. it might be a much shorter time frame, but we need to accelerate some changes to the framework? Mm. That's to anyone in the panel. Look, um, free trade agreements are you know, going to change the environment, but the, Australian, the environment was changed with the exchange rate. Um, and the issue then becomes how do you respond to a very difficult environment? Historically, Australia's industry policy has been a very unhelpful one between protection and free trade. I mean, uh, we've had a whole institutional apparatus called the Industry Assistance Commission, then, you know, subsequently the Productivity Commission, where there were two choices in the world. You put up barrier protection in the form of tariffs or quotas, or you had free trade. Well, the world is a little more complicated. And um, I think we need to think about how do you make the best of your comparative advantage. Like, Ricardo has a theory of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage doesn't just fall like heaven from the sky. The state has to mobilise resources to ensure that you reap the full benefits of what nature's bequeathed you. And I think we need to have a far more sophisticated debate about how we work with comparative advantage. And um, so, that's all a long way of saying, on current policy settings, I think the free trade agreement will be difficult and make life even harder for manufacturing. That is not inevitable. It's because of political choices made by the Australian public to date in the tolerating the policy regime we have, but that's not inevitable. It does require, though, very clear leadership from the engineering employers to stand up and say what it's going to take to reap the full benefits. Um, and unless that clear leadership comes from the engineering employers, it's not going to come from anywhere else. And if I may add to that, John, the, um, I think on the whole what we see is that you know, free trade over time enhances competitiveness of firms. Um, but that is based on the fact that free trade is a balanced thing. So one of the things when you enter into an agreement is make sure that the other party keeps to it. And, and there, are some, uh, there are some really clever, clever tricks that other parties may use and then we have two choices. Either we jump on them or we use the same tricks ourselves and we are fairly naive in, in how to play that game. Uh, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing, I think, is to, to realize that, that the structure of manufacturing, like everything else, is changing. And, and we mentioned outsourcing before, and that has a bearing on this. There are kind of three waves. There is the, the original wave of outsourcing, where we, we kind of move the production to somewhere else. And, and that's basically, from our point of view, more or less gone. Then the next wave is when you move other things, R&D, administration, services, outsourced. And from Australia's point of view, we are more or less in that, in that area now. Then there's the third wave where you move things back uh, for a number of reasons. And just structurally to point out that those reasons are not that you happen to have a low energy price. That's an aberration, which is the US scenario that. It is not that you made a mistake in the first place, which actually is the majority why a sort of German companies are moving back. It is because you have higher value ability, creation abilities by moving it back. And at the moment, that's the minority of those reversals, but they are still happening. Now, the interesting thing about those is that different countries are in different places of that. So whereas Australia is somewhere in the middle between the wave of outsourcing production and the wave of outsourcing services. Germany is somewhere between the outsourcing of services and the resourcing of, of activities. And China is smack bang in the acceleration phase of outsourcing or production. So they are struggling mightily at the moment. Every Chinese large manufacturer of furniture have just outsourced the production to Vietnam. So they are, you know, so they are, so this is just something that everybody goes through. It's just a matter of where you are in those areas. And when you're entering into a free trade agreement, you have to be clear on what it is you want to achieve through that, for whom, and what price you're willing to pay, and how you make sure that that ends up. And I'm not sure we are quite that clear around those things. Um, from my perspective, still free trade agreement means you're going to be exporting to a nation. You need to get out of the office and innovate with those customers. And I think that's fundamentally, if you don't have that will to do that and have a deep understanding of what that looks like to, to where you are, might be um, um, where you're based, it, it's still going to fail. Another question at the front of the aisle there. Hi. Um, I just wanted to 
have a little bit of a chat about our young people and the jobs of the future, the manufacturing jobs of the future. We've talked a little bit about STEM, we've talked a little bit about uh, the vet sector and potential changes that might need to be seen there. Um, but what have you seen that maybe is a barrier in our educational sector or sectors that will stop our young people having skills for the future? I'll start then, since that's easy. I think the biggest barriers to the children having the skills and the attitudes that's appropriate to the future are the teachers. Uh, teachers here have insufficient competence in some of these areas, and they have an outdated knowledge of what the economy looks like, and hence the attitudes that they transmit to the children is not necessarily very helpful. Um, so I think that is the biggest barrier. Um, I mean, if, if you want to look at um, a good OECD system, you know, everybody looks at Finland, uh, you know, and the reason for Finland being good is basically the the teachers are perceived to be the uh, creators of tomorrow's society, hence they have a very high social standing. They're not necessarily very highly paid, but they have a very high social standing. They're required to have a master in pedagogical sciences so they can teach. They're also required to have a degree one level above the level they're going to teach the subject they teach. So if you're going to teach math on level, you need a bachelor on it and so on. So they have you know, high re requirements in the subject matter as well as pedagogical issues. And they are not evaluated ex post, they are evaluated ex ante. In other words, once they have passed all these hurdles, government tells them, now we trust you, you go away and do your job, and we are not going to chase you down with evaluations because that will come apparent. Mm. Look, um, it's, I think it's uh, too easy to attack teachers. and We, we as a society um, value s scholarship. I speak at a university and I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. We had to evaluate the Carmichael pilots in the early 90s and one of the best quotes I ever got came back to me from one of my researchers and he came back and he said, this teacher said, the real problem we have is what do we do with the bottom 80%? Now, think about that, you know, the, the school system is essentially structured to service universities. And we've, over the last 20 years, boosted participation rates. We actually haven't thought about what we do, and vetting schools has been jammed in on the side and not thought through. Now, you can't blame teachers alone for that. We, as a society, have supported an education system that re rewards the, the academic outcome, and I think... I was talking about an aid style campaign around STEM. That's not just a campaign to get everyone to love doing maths homework. That's got to be about integrating um, maths departments in schools with employers that use maths. It's about integ integrating um, science departments in schools with um, hospitals that use the biology. I've seen this in some overseas schools. That's a totally different way about thinking about what vocational education is. It's not. The, the thing that kids who can't make it to university do. You've got to bring a notion of vocation into all parts of the curriculum. And we've written on this uh, at length. And for me, um, that's not going to be easy to change. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I do, I've done a lot of research. And um, that vision of what education is like is deeply ingrained. And it's not you know, an individual failure of the teachers. Parents want their kids to go to university. Right? You talk to, um, say, teachers are a part of it, but we as a society, like I said, that's why I gave the AIDS example, we as a society have got to really have a, a, a campaign to think about what we value. And I'm, I'm saying we've got to change that. And historically, Australia's been there. Like the apprenticeship system and the development of intermediate skills in the 19th century was an absolute crisis. Right? Australia could have gone exactly the same way as the Americans. Like you just can't find a fitter for dust in the US. Right, they, they smashed their apprenticeship system to smithereens in the 1890s, early 1900s. Australia took a completely different route. It built up a, a, a publicly based technical education system and an award system to structure intermediate later markets. It created the infrastructure for quality jobs at that level. We've got to have a similar type movement. And until you have that kind of wholesale shift in what a society values, we're just simply going to be talking about vetting schools as an afterthought and teachers who don't take the issues up. I think this, uh, there's a fundamental issue here also about the perception of manufacturing, you know, um, and, and then how that shapes the workforce of the future. I mean, we're still talking about 
apprenticeships and uh, you know fitters and turners and and all that. When future manufacturing is much more than that, mm. you know, it's a very knowledge-based uh, you know activities around design, mm. a lot around additive manufacturing, mm. perhaps, uh, you know. So I I think. <laughs> I often say that the biggest problem with manufacturing is the word manufacturing itself. You know that manufacturing is very diverse. There's so many different aspects to manufacturing, but we, when we talk manufacturing, we tend to think, you know, machining and and, and so on, or, or worse. So, with due respect, I mean, uh, to to those professions, it's just that we need a forward-looking view of manufacturing, and then that shapes perception of parents as well. Not only, the, not only teachers, uh, but also parents in encouraging you know, children to enter in a high-tech, knowledge-based mm. trades or careers. Uh, and and uh, there have been various uh, surveys done where you know, parents have a lot of empathy for manufacturing but wouldn't recommend it for their children. Mm. So that's a fundamental problem in itself. And for I what it's worth. <laughs> and just building upon that, I, I see a lot of first-year students you know, they talk about their career development, you know, and they're just not inspired by, by um, the organisations. They don't want to go work for large corporates anymore. And you see this real notion of wanting to be entrepreneurial and actually do their own startups. But as a systemic problem, they're not actually then supported. So I think one of the things, we, best things we can do is actually build that inspiration that it's actually not a, a single discipline. You're actually able to work across an organisation. And, and what does good look like? Help firms communicate that rather than, I think, going back to everyone's point. Mm. I, I think that's uh, such a crucial point because we are talking of uh, someone embarking on a career, you know, uh, learning a single trade, when in fact the future is about multidisciplinary skills. Mm. So a manufacturing worker, you know, has half a dozen different sk skill mm. sets to start off with rather than saying, you know, I'm a machiner or mm. a, a tooling person. And I think that's probably the way we need to reframe, you know, uh, reframe the, the future workforce. It makes them more agile, you know, mm -hmm. more mobile, more portable, you know, so. Oh, well, yeah. That's what we were developing with that notion of vocation. Mm -hmm. Like we say, as you look across the economy, you can probably identify seven or eight vocational domains. And then it kind of really doesn't matter what future hits you, you've got a whole mm -hmm. set of capabilities embedded in your population. But that's not, that, that, that's an idea at the moment. You know, it's not the mainstream. In the past, historic, um, manufacturing has played a lead in that kind of thing. And I think manufacturers have just got to get a bit more confidence too. I think they've been beaten around so much. <laughs> I think that's where you know, they've got to think about that they are the repositories of deep expertise and, and really important ideas. But it requires that manufacturers think of themselves broader than makers of things. Mm. Mm. So, so if, you, if you think that you're just a maker of things, then of course the, the range of skills required to fulfill that, that, that role is more limited. But if you think of yourself as a you know, kind of full breadth you know, services kind of firm, mm. then suddenly all the skills required mm. opens up, right? Then you need more multidisciplinary mm. skills. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to look at some of these areas. Uh, firstly, I think that um, we need to expose people visually. I mean, it's the old Toyota principle of see, touch, feel, right? So, um, you know, everybody needs to get a feeling for what a modern manufacturing facility looks like. It's clean, it's uh, light, it's exciting work, it's high technology. So people have that mindset rather than noisy, dirty, with sparks flying and dangerous, you know, which is a fairly outdated reality. Uh, I, I agree completely with that. We also have a cultural issue, and I agree completely with that too. I mean, I lived uh, numerous years in the UK, and of course, having two daughters, the uh, you wouldn't want your daughters to marry an engineer. You know, it's a dirt, dirty nails and speaks with a funny <laughs> accent and have to work all the time, you know? <laughs> you wanted your daughters to marry somebody who preferably didn't have to work, and if they did have to work, it would be make-believe work, like going to the city. <laughs> so, so the, you know, whereas if, you know, if I come back to where I am from Germanic part of Europe, you would not want your daughter to marry an accountant or a lawyer, but of course there were the people who weren't smart enough to get into engineering school. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a fundamental cultural issue, mm -hmm. this type of scenario. If you look at you know, where I come from, the traditional managerial pathway was in, in order to get somewhere in the company, you started with an engineering degree. That was your base degree. That was none other. That was a base degree, engineering. 
Then you uh, did, because we had national service, then you did an officer training. And that was not by your choice, you were picked by the army. So you had an officer training, so you learned to lead people in bunches of a couple of hundred from work your way up, in this sense. So you became an officer, so you got a military experience, you learned to lead people and learned what makes people tick, people from all kinds of works, works of life. And then you went off, worked for five years, and then you got the language of management by an MBA. Those were the three packages that were required to take responsibilities in a sophisticated manufacturing firm. Without those, you had no career you know, in this area. And, it, and everybody knew that. There was a well-known activity. From the age I was this big, I, I was taught the welfare of our nation rests on our ability to add value to things that we can sell to others that they pay a lot for. That will make your life good. You have a responsibility to contribute to that. That was ingrained from me being this long. Right? Mm -hmm. It came through school all the way. It's an absolute natural way of thinking mm -hmm. where I come from. Mm -hmm. yeah. here, here we are taught where you can dig stuff up to sell, right? Yeah, that's yes. good. <laughs> but who <laughs> makes your shovels? <laughs> <laughs> We're probably heading for the last question now. One last question. We'll time for an anecdote. Uh, uh, down in the front here. Look, my, my question really is about how we start to integrate some of this stuff. Um, Australia's um, manufacturing industry is, um, by far, you know, 85% SME, something like that, whatever, around about that figure. And that's fairly typical across the world as well. But um, in, in John's work, he talked about, um, you know, having a look at these streams of um, engineering, logistics, materials handling, business professionals and um, customer services. You add the dimension of servitisation on top of that and a management um, uh, philosophy and practice that encourages innovation and so on. All that sort of good stuff there. Now, if you're LG and you want to sell a refrigeration service to every domestic consumer, that's a different issue where, like the GE with their selling, you know, engine air power time to a, an aircraft company, they lease it out. You never buy the engine and you don't look after servicing, they do it all for you and LG would provide the fridge for you like we do mostly on a photocopier in an office, that sort of stuff like that. And that's servitisation to that degree. In a manufacturing environment, though, it's not an LG with, um, you know, 28,000 employees and offices in every, you know, city in the world and so on. Um, it's the 20 and 40 and 50 person SME. Mm -hmm. So how do we look at the blend of those things yet still retain the key skills that we saw in individuals um, at various points in that enterprise and organisation? Mm -hmm. So... The, there's no simple answer, obviously, but it's um, thoughts would be really appreciated. Mm. Well, that's why I said in my presentation, I think you've, you've really got to segment manufacturing down. So um, even within food, there's different subsectors within food. You know, within machinery equipment, there are different subsectors. And I think it's in those, as you get to those more refined categories, you can start to find commonalities where people can start to potentially... Uh, have a common interest. I mean, and I know it's, this is really hard to do, like getting Australian employers to get over the um, prohibition against collaboration, which is, you know, anti-competitive. But I think when you get down to those specific areas, like, you know, the dairy food producers, what can they do about positioning themselves for a particular market? Um, uh, I think that's the way to do it. And But once again, that there, there's a missing category in our policy apparatus, and that is um, people who can actually make those connections. What I what I call brokers in the research we have, and that's a, that's like a fundamental weakness in you know the employer association community and in the uh, public service. There just aren't those people who play that catalytic brokerage role. And I think if you can build up that capability, then I think you will start to get a. a more choices than you currently have, but without that capability, it's not going to happen spontaneously. And you've got lessons from that from the skill ecosystem pilots and the workforce development funds spawned a whole lot of things which have generated um, examples around that. But that that ultimately has to be um, funded by the public sector or I work with the dairy farmers in this and the dairy farmers got fed up waiting for the, waiting for the government, so they just taxed themselves. They just levied themselves and they paid for their own brokers to do it. The, the farmers in some cases are more, far more advanced than most employers in the rest of the economy. When they see a common problem, they, they just go for it. And I think that's the kind of 
for me, that's the thing. Overcoming that common property problem is the key issue. Um, I've been experimenting with a number of different small programs. Again, SME, really focused, you know, under $10, $10 million companies um, who go on complete transformation about around who their customer is. And the way we've done it is to scale costing and what have you is actually as cohorts. So as cohorts of learning, and you, you're going to go and then disrupt their business, but you make sure the CEO is there, you make sure the marketing manager, or, you know, whoever looks after marketing, whoever looks after some sort of technical development, and you bring enough of them along, and actually as a cohort, they start to build that social capital amongst each other. And, and for me, that's been in, in South Australia, the, the best model of actually seeing that scale and having those small clusters work together. And then they can actually start to dictate the sorts of expertise and services or knowledge that they actually need collectively, because generally they're the same problems, and they're non-competing firms. And it's been quite a successful model. But that was you as the catalyst, was it? I, I started as the catalyst, but yeah. I made myself redundant very quickly. Okay. I think um, what Sam is indicating is very important. Um, taking South Australia as an example, because that is what I know, we have, we have identified and worked quite clearly with a with number of firms. It's been self-selecting. Mm. Uh, and the reason we've done that is primarily because you um, you want them to have skin in the game. Uh, and so we have charged them a lot for this. This is non... I mean, I've done a program here in Victoria. There was subsidy at a level, I think, they paid $800 or something ridiculous like that, which means they have no skin in the game, which means they don't care. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, we charged them $10,000 for the same thing. Uh, for $10,000, they care. Okay? They really make sure they get value out of it. And it is remarkable how different the success was with what is similar firms. The success for the 800, doubtful. The, the success for the 10,000, enormous. They've all made millions, okay, out of this, these type mm -hmm. of programs. And, and the, the issue is that they came there, we said we required a CEO and two other people, you know, and we required them 10 days during a year and we require them to do work in between. That means that the 10,000 is peanuts compared to what it costs them to be there. But we, they, and then having paid the 10,000, they turned up and we said, if you do not get value of every session that you can go to, some, don't turn up at the next and we'll refund you, okay? They all came every time. They all have evaluated it afterwards and they've all multiplied the turnover. So the key issue is you can do this in an issue, but it, it has to be done in a way that you are targeting these people for who they are, they are SMEs. You're working with people who are willing to learn, so that's self-selection. Mm -hmm. You ensure they have skin in the game so they make sure they really get the value out of these things and put the effort in required to get the return out of these things. And you follow up and make sure that you can verify the claims that are made on these type of scenarios. They also learn each other in these areas. And I, I do think that, that um, we are shooting ourselves in the foot by having created what is a handout culture. You know, government expects to go and fund these things. You know, and the companies say, well, please pay for me to come and learn. What idiocity is that? You know, it's the company's own responsibility to make sure that it has its ability to compete. And if it doesn't put its money where its mouth is and its requirement, it deserves to die, okay? And then I come in with my other policy and help them. <laughs> That's all right. So, you know, it, it is this issue. And I think, you know, just before the SMEs, that's, you know, it's actually easier to work with an SME because you have decision makers there. They can move quickly. A large multinational is full of bureaucracy and takes an enormous amount of time to turn like an oil tanker. And it's huge amount of effort to do something with that. Sweet. Sweet. Matt, you want to make the last comment? That's putting you on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I, I think I can repeat the comment I made earlier. You know, it, it's about how a manufacturing business sees itself. You know, does it understand that you know, it, it's no longer just making things in the future? So if, if it doesn't actually take that mental step, then how is it actually going to embrace you know, our further innovation? So I think Perhaps you know the one. I mean, I, I keep saying saying it over and over again. You know, manufacturing is not just about making things in spite of the rhetoric. It's about being a successful business, whatever it takes. Yeah. Okay. So, look. In that case, can you give the uh, panel a big hand? Thank you. Thank you.